Hi, it's Jake. Welcome to The Voluntary Life. I'm really uh, excited to have Jamie uh, on the line from Beijing. Um, and Jamie's on the line because uh, we're talking today about freedom to live and work anywhere or abroad and the opportunities that that, that can bring uh, in terms of um, of getting more freedom in your life. So um, welcome to the show, Jamie. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So I, I would love to hear, first of all, just for people who, who obviously don't know, where, where are you now and what's your sort of experience of, of living abroad been so far? So where, where have you been for the last few years? Okay, well, uh, I've been living in Asia for just under two years. I left the States where I grew up um, and where I studied, went to school, worked, all of that in February 2010. Um, I lived in South Korea for a year where I taught English, and then I, last March, uh, the beginning of last March, I moved to Beijing, China, um, and that's where I've been ever since. Cool. And you work in Beijing um, freelance as a writer and, and so forth, is that right? Yes. Yeah. I, I actually came over as an English teacher, um, did that for a month in China, but had kind of had enough of English teaching over here. Uh, and since, uh, since about a month after I arrived, I've been doing freelance writing, um, mostly writing for different publications around Beijing. I've been doing um, some stuff for different media companies, doing editing, uh, all kinds of freelancing, but mostly within the realm of writing and editing. Right, right. So what was the reason for you to decide to go and live abroad? And I mean, what, what was your thinking behind it? And, and what has it sort of done for you? Um, there were a few reasons that I decided to move abroad. Um, one was just that ever since I was younger, I had wanted to travel. And um, I just I just kind of never did. I got caught in this cycle of always doing internships and, and stuff like that. When I was in college, I didn't really study abroad um, or do much traveling during the summers. Um, I went to grad school right after I finished my undergrad. And then I got a job immediately. And I kind of got to the point where I was like, my life is going in a direction where I'm not going to travel for years and years. And I really want to see the world. Um, so I started to kind of reevaluate what I was doing um, and what I sort of where my career was going. Um, but there were a couple of other factors, too. I mean, someone mentioned to me, um, I ran into an old college friend, and she mentioned to me that her brother had been teaching English in South Korea, and he was making all this money, and he didn't have to pay rent. The school paid for it, and so he was able to pay all these bills off and living like a king and traveling all over, and it sounded amazing. It actually sounded too good to be true, I thought, um, but right. I looked into it, and I, I found out that there is a huge demand for English teachers um, in South Korea, in China, um, and in, in various parts of Asia, so... I thought, wow, that's awesome. Like, I can make more money than I'm making now. I was living in Washington, D.C., which is an extremely expensive city to live in. Mm. So it was. I just felt like I was in this rut of I'm just constantly living paycheck to paycheck, and I, I just feel kind of drained by the lifestyle here. Um, so I decided to go over to Korea and um, check that out. Um, but it was also because I actually really was feeling um, just kind of, I'm trying to think of the word. Uh, I didn't feel free at all when I was living in D.C. And part of that was I um, I was working on Capitol Hill, not for a, a politician, but um, for a publication there. And while it was really good professional experience, um, I realized I started to have some realizations about the government. Uh, and I was like, I cannot sit here and I, I just can't do this. Like, I feel like all I'm doing is playing into this horrible, evil system and you know, some people that I met in D.C. were great, but a lot of it was just very pretentious, uh, really like false personalities. And I felt exhausted by it. And I thought, you know what? I don't want to do this forever. I can make money in Korea. I speak English, just pretty much the only requirement that uh, that you need to be a native English speaker. So I moved overseas. Um, and immediately I felt like this huge weight lifted off my shoulders. Um, just being out of this grind that I had been in, um, just moving to a new place, being surrounded by like things that were completely, completely foreign to me um, was just exciting. It was really stimulating. Um, I made decent money in Korea, which was great because it allowed me to do some traveling and to, you know, just to, even just to explore South Korea was was incredible. Um, so, yeah, right away I felt that um, it was I, I had no regrets about the decision. I felt happier and freer. 
as soon as I left and it's only increased from there. Right, right. Yeah, because I mean, I know what you mean. And there is that um, that period when you first go and live abroad, because I actually went to to live in Berlin um, in the early oh. 90s. And and I spent quite a few years um, sort of going uh, living in Berlin and then going back and forth um, between uh, London and, and Berlin. And for me, uh, I don't know if this is the case for you, but just the choice to basically to change countries, to uproot yourself and go and live in a completely different place with a completely different language and culture and so forth. You have to it's almost like you kind of reboot your entire social life and and your well, everything, really. You have to like for me, the experience was that you you get to kind of very consciously say like, well, I'm in a new place. I'm going to live in a, a, a new life here. So what do I want that life to be? You know, and it kind of forces you to to um, to reassess that. Is is that the experience that you had as well? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I definitely had that. I mean, as soon as I got there, I had this feeling of, you know, I am surrounded by completely new people and I can kind of be, I can really make my life whatever I want it to be. And I definitely reevaluated like, who am I? What kind of people do I want to be around? Um, I felt like I was able to be a lot more honest about, about myself and um, really evaluate the kind of relationships that I wanted to have. And yeah, I mean, just it was it really it felt like an opportunity to start over. Right, right. Completely fresh in a new place, just trying new things and developing new interests. It was really, really stimulating, I found. Because mm. I think some it, it can be the case that, um, you know, especially uh, where where people grow up, if they go to school and they go to college and and um, sort of then start, start earning money. There's, there can be a lot of inertia in people's social life where, you know, you have all these relationships with friends, with family, um, with work colleagues that have just sort of accumulated and, and may have, you know, at one point in your life may have been very invigorating and, and, uh, and, and given you a lot. But sometimes I think moving abroad can really make you reassess like, well, which friends do I really value? And, you know, what do I actually get out of these relationships? And, and, you know, you may find that it actually confirms that you really miss some people because they're very important to you. But for a lot of people I know who've, who've gone abroad, there's been a, a big change in their social lives because in a sense it, it has, it, it does provide a kind of um, decision point for you to reassess like, well, do I really want to stay in touch with these friends or, um, you know, and, and what kind of new friends do I do? I, what kind of new friendships and relationships do I want to build? And is that the kind of thing that you experienced with your friendships as well? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's partly because when you move uh, to another country, or to the other side of the world, uh, you, ha you do have to put a bit more effort into your friendships um, and you know, keeping in touch because you can't just go hang out with them. You just can't go visit for the weekend, that kind of thing. Mm. Um, so it's a lot more, you know, coordinating Skype calls or this or that, or like trying to make a visit, that kind of thing. Um, and I think you start to realize who do I get the most value from? Who are the people who I feel most excited to talk to? Who do I miss? And I think you start to, um, be a little more, um, it's just a, a little choosier, I guess, mm. about where you're spending your time and which relationships you're continuing to develop. And you kind of realize the ones that maybe you're willing to let fall by the wayside because um, they're just not a priority anymore. Mm. And um, right. I, I also kind of think it's a great opportunity because sometimes, uh, sort of like you were saying, you, you get into this habit of you have all of these old relationships, like with your family, uh, with friends, and you're in a certain, um, just in, like on a certain path in your life. And I think that sometimes you can kind of get stuck maybe in a place that you don't want to be um, or you get you sort of take on like a, a certain role in your social group and maybe you want to grow out of that. Um, and that can be really tough when you've been doing the same thing um, and having the same dynamic with people for years and years and years. And when you move overseas and you're by yourself, it's, it really is just a chance to say, okay, well, who do I want to be now? Right, and what right. kind of do I want in my life? Um, and, and that is amazing. It's, it's really a, a great growth experience, I think. Yeah, it is incredibly liberating, and it's it's the the way what you're talking about in terms of 
taking on over time this dynamic with your friendships and stuff sometimes it can be really hard to actually be conscious of that of what you of you know the dynamics that you do have until you get yourself out of those relationships for a while and you're in a completely new place where you can actually sort of see how how different you can feel with new people and stuff and in in some ways you know it's hard to really see um the wood for the trees you know what i mean it's like it, it's hard to 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 know how much inertia has built up until you have had one of those kind of changes of going to live abroad or something like that which really really brings those things into focus at least that was that was my experience yeah yeah i definitely think that's true you need, you definitely need to get some space from it um before you can realize um exactly what role you've been playing and mm. um and sort of the dynamic of your relationships. And I think sometimes you realize it when maybe there's someone who you've always kind of thought of as a really good friend or someone you really enjoyed being around. And then a few months goes by and you haven't talked to them and then you try to catch up and you just realize, wow, I have changed so much. Like this doesn't really, like if you're being honest about your feelings and, and where you are, it can be, I mean, it can be kind of sad actually sometimes, yeah. but yeah. it's also a great wake up call to say, okay, wow, like I've definitely changed I'm kind of figuring out who I am, but this relationship with this person is different than what I thought it was. Right, right. The other thing that I noticed, you know, just in terms of making the the first step in in going to live abroad, and I'm I'm wondering, I I mean, this possibly is even more extreme because you you went to um, South Korea and then China, which, uh, you know, the language and and the media and everything is so different um, compared to, I was just going from England to Germany, but... One another thing that has a certain amount of inertia in 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 life can be that when you're surrounded by the same sort of uh, magazines and and media and culture, basically um, the background noise of the place that you grew up in, that stuff uh, it it can be hard to sort of really realise how much that permeates life around you. And then when you go abroad, my my experience was. You know, if the language is different, the words are different, the, you know, the, the culture is different, it can actually make you take much more of a kind of objective look at, at culture in general, because, you know, it's not like you suddenly feel a, an affinity to a different culture or whatever. For me, it was more like you see that all of these things are just, in a way, there's a lot of cultural differences that are so meaningless that you know people do one thing in one place and another thing in another but there's not, not necessarily any rational basis for any of that and it, it helped me to feel i mean this kind of sounds kind of cheesy but i really did feel more like i was able to see myself as a part of humanity and that you know having grown up in england yes i mean there's a lot of subconscious messages about that that you you know it's, it's hard to to really realize that you've taken a lot on a lot of those but when you go and live in a different culture you can also see that these are all just um you know just local uh irrational differences in certain respects and and you can see yourself you know much more as as just uh part of of humanity i mean is that an experience that, that you had in terms of the kind of the culture shock if you like yeah, yeah, it definitely has. And it's some it's something that I'm not always conscious of, but then something will come up, someone will tell me something, even about America or about the culture here, and I'm just like, that's so strange. This is so weird, and I feel so removed from, right, right. like, prejudices and, and things, and the way that people, a lot of people think, like, I forget sometimes um, the different like the cultural differences and how people do things and certain like yeah just prejudices that that i think i probably took on growing up in the u.s and it just makes you realize that this is crazy like this is irrational and um i definitely i feel very removed from a lot of that kind of stuff um Mm -hmm. and yeah i i totally connect with what you were saying um about just feeling more like part of humanity i Mm. see a lot i mean there's a lot of irrationality and there's a lot of things that it takes uh that takes some getting used to over here um and that are really frustrating but i think that's i don't see uh yeah i i think i see people in a very different way than i used to right 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 i i also i found that um just and I'm not sure sort of how uh, how how much sort of Korean you learned or, or how much Chinese you speak, but I also found just the process of trying to learn and speak and think in a different language that itself is kind of interesting because you realize that even the language that you speak has 
certain it, it has kind of grooves in your way of thinking that when you when you really um sort of learn a different language you're able to to step outside of i mean for me like english can be very ambivalent ambiguous and you can say things in english that you know without really saying how you feel or what you think about something you can just say a lot of words right whereas in german it, it can be a very precise language and that just that itself is kind of interesting because it got me to think about you know what it was that i was actually saying and it also got, got me to think about you know what different words really mean i don't know if that's sort of if i'm um explaining that very well but did you do you find that sort of dealing with a different language changes the way that you think about things as well i think i didn't learn enough korean and i haven't learned enough chinese yet i i think to get to that point right. um but that is really interesting i can definitely see how that happens um and I've I've actually talked to other people who um, either learned Korean or learned Chinese and know it very well, and they they kind of describe something similar where they have to think a lot more about what they're saying and how they're phrasing it, and um, you know depending on which language they're using. And I have I actually had a Korean friend who told me that the way that he expresses himself is so different in both languages, and that he uses English when he wants to just like talk and express a feeling. And Korean is a lot, um, he said it's much harder to do that in Korean because there's a lot of rules, there's a lot of cultural things that come along with the Korean language. Um, like you have to use a certain way of speaking for people who are older than you or who are your boss or something like that. Oh, yeah, right, the different formalities of which, which yeah. who you're addressing. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so he said it, it can be really tough to do that, to like really just express yourself or your feelings or any kind of excitement or anything like that in Korean. So he uses English because mm. um, he said he finds it much easier um, and more natural in a way for those kind of conversations. Mm, yeah. Yeah, I can imagine that. There are, there are, there are some sort of uh, things to do. Like I always found it a bit confusing in German, just the, the difference between you have to make a decision about whether you address someone as Z or do, which is basically the formal or the informal. And there's, uh, there's a whole etiquette around that, which I just always found so confusing. Like, well, how, you know, how does this, this work? But it gets you thinking as well about, uh, about the language. And even if, even on a sort of like practical level, I remember, I mean, this, these are kind of trivial examples, but I remember when I learned the word um, uh, for helicopter, which is Hubschrauber in German, which basically Huben is like to lift and Schrauben is to spin. So it literally means lift spinner. And you kind of, you kind of think, you're like, oh, yeah, I suppose that is what a helicopter is. You know? <laughs> it, it's like, it, it, do you see what I mean? It's like very, very um, descriptive of what, of what the thing is. I was, I, was once, yeah. um, I was once on a train and I didn't know a word. I saw the word um, zusammenbrechen, and I knew that the word zusammen means uh, together, and I knew the word brechen means break. So I was thinking, together break, together break. Oh, it's collapse, because a collapse is like uh -oh. something breaking together, you know? And it, it's sort of, it, it, what I find interesting about it, you probably experienced this when you learn um, more more Chinese as well, is that it kind of makes you think about the concepts and what, what they're actually about, just because we're so used to the words that we don't even we don't even hear them anymore. If you see what I mean? Yes. Yeah. I definitely I definitely agree with that. Mm. But I imagine with Asian languages, there's also some very very different because there, there's just there's all sorts of complexities there. Like the, in Chinese, you have to learn the characters and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, there's definitely, uh, there's a lot. I actually think that, I can, I'm trying to think of an example, but um, I've definitely heard things similar to what you're saying about German, um, where even with the characters, like the things that they represent are, are quite literal, but they right. make sense. Right. You know, it's kind of strange to hear like certain words put together when it's translated to English, but then, yeah, you realize, okay, yeah, that's exactly what it is. Right. This makes sense. It's awkward because it's not the kind of, it's not the way that we would phrase it in English, but you know, it, it's understandable. It's really interesting. Mm. Yeah, I think it's a, an, it's another, I mean, it's a sort of a side benefit from going to live abroad, but it's kind of interesting that you do, you do get to kind of, um, in a sense, re relearn the world with new words, you know, which, which can be fun too. Yeah, absolutely. I also found um, that with the language issue, I felt like I developed a greater sense of empathy um, for 
immigrants who come to the U.S. and don't speak English. And having been around a lot of people growing up who would get really, would feel really passionate, like, oh, you know, when people come here, they should learn language immediately. This is ridiculous. And and I understand, and it is frustrating sometimes. Like, I remember I would be at, at work and people would try to talk to me and would not speak any English. And I would feel frustrated that I couldn't communicate with them, that kind of thing. But when I first got to Korea, I... It wasn't that bad because I lived in Seoul and a lot of people in Seoul speak English. So it wasn't that hard to get by. But when I was on my own um, in a taxi one time, I felt, I remember feeling extremely frustrated because I couldn't, I didn't have enough words to communicate to the driver what I was, what I wanted him to do. And I could tell he was getting frustrated because he kept trying to talk to me and he was being nice, but he just didn't understand where I wanted to go. And I was just kind of, I felt overwhelmed a little bit. And then I realized I was like, you know what? I am going to remember this. If I'm ever back in the U.S. and I come across someone who is struggling to communicate, like I, I'm not going to get annoyed. I'm going to remember this because right. it is extremely frustrating. And when we go through that, and it, it can be really scary, too, to be on your own somewhere, not be able to communicate with anyone, and almost have that feeling, um, maybe this was just projection, but I've also seen uh, people in the West treat um, foreigners like this, but you almost get that feeling like, oh, this person thinks that I'm an idiot, and I'm not. I just don't know how to communicate with them. Right. Um, and so it definitely uh, it makes me look at at other people a lot differently. I think and helps me have more empathy for them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because you have had the experience of basically being an immigrant, right? I mean, that's essentially yeah. what living all it means to uh, to go and live abroad. Um, so I was going to ask you about um, the opportunities in terms of the cost of living the standard of living and you know you mentioned sort of the that that was one of the the things that you saw as a as a real opportunity um you know in comparison to the the high cost of living that you were experiencing when you were living back in dc so can right. you talk a bit about you know both for you and for other people that you know um uh, living abroad like how would you compare the kind of opportunities in terms of you know what you can what you can do with the money that you're earning where you are compare in comparison to maybe what your life would have been like if you'd stayed in the kind of job that you were that you were in when you were back in the states right um well in china especially I, there's just tons of opportunities and the cost of living even in beijing is so low that um it's really easy to get by even if you're not bringing in a lot of money right away um, which was important for me when I started freelancing because I had some money saved, but I didn't really have much to go on. I mean, I was just kind of scrambling and trying to get things going. But the cost of living is so low. I mean, um, if you think about it, uh, like $20, 20 U.S. dollars, I mean, you could spend that pretty quickly here. But if you were on a budget, um, you could make that last, like several meals. You could make it last for probably an entire week. Um I mean, that's how cheap food is. Uh, Chinese, especially Chinese food, is right. is extremely right. cheap. Um, and that's really important because um, when you're, you know, sometimes things get tough, and whether you're freelancing or whatever you're doing, sometimes things come up and and you get a little low on cash. But it is easy; you can get by here. Whereas in the states, even when I had a decent paycheck coming in every month, I would find that by payday I was just scrambling, like I just between paying my bills, paying my rent, um, you know, like all of my utilities, buying groceries, that kind of thing, the money was gone mm. right away, um, which was really frustrating. And it made it extremely difficult to save or to, to try to do anything. Um, and here, I mean, even the utilities are, I mean, it's maybe like maybe $30 for um, the electricity for the month. And that's with, you know, two people living in an apartment uh, using like running the heaters all the time, constantly having things going. Um, so it's, right. it's pretty good. Um, so I think that there's a lot of opportunities over here. Um, I mean, there's, especially in China, mm -hmm. there's just so much happening. Like in Beijing is growing all the time and there's always ads or you hear from someone about, you know, Oh, this company opened and they need people. Um, or, I mean, there's always English teaching jobs. That's like, a, that's the, Without a doubt, you can always get a job teaching English and making decent money doing that. But there's also so many industries are growing. There's always companies looking for for new people um, and willing to pay decent money. Um, so yeah, there's just 
compared to, and I don't think that that was the case in DC. I mean, even granted, I was a journalist, and uh, that's kind of a tough field to be in right now in in the West in general. I think, mm -hmm. um, and maybe everywhere, but I never got the sense that there was a lot uh, a lot of opportunity going on. It was like you have a job, you should cling to it because otherwise, who knows when your next your next one is going to come around. Whereas right. here, like. There's just always stuff, um, you know, if things get a little low, then you do a little tutoring or you can do a voice recording job for some educational company that needs to record a textbook or there's just so much happening and there's always ways to make money. Right, right. It's interesting because, you know, it, when you talk about the the um, the, the um, living expenses being so low, uh, if you want to do something new, like start freelancing or whatever, you need that breathing space where you're going to be trying to get into a field. You're not going to be making much money for a while. And just by living somewhere where the cost of living is that bit lower, it seems like you get a lot more room. Whereas, as you say, if you're already living in a very expensive city, you've got to make rent, you've got to pay the bills and everything. You just don't have the breathing space to, to necessarily try out something, something new in the same way. Oh, yeah. Yeah, not at all. I mean, I always think that this is... I mean, I don't know what other cities in Asia would be like. I know that in Seoul, I wouldn't have been able to do this, but that has more to do with the visa situation there. Mm -hmm. um, because right. in order to get a working visa, you have to be sponsored by an employer. Um, so, and most, and I've, I've heard, and I've, from what I've observed, it's very hard to get a job doing anything besides English teaching um, right. because the employer has to prove that, you know, you're doing, that they absolutely need to bring in a foreigner and that Koreans can't do this job and, and so it's really difficult. But, um, yeah, in Beijing, there's definitely um, – I I can't imagine anywhere else that I could be doing what I'm doing right now right. just because the cost of living is so low. There's so much happening, a lot of opportunity. Like, you never really get to a point where you think, oh, my God, I don't know what I'm going to do. I have no work this month. Like, I'm not bringing anything in. That pretty much never happens. Yeah, it sounds like a really good mixture between low cost of living but also lots of dynamic um, – opportunities in terms of just you know bringing in making rent by doing whatever you need to do in terms of um you know part-time jobs or or other things um what about what about housing costs because i mean that can be even in some cities where you find that you know maybe food and other things can be relatively cheap um especially if there's been like a, a property boom you can sometimes find that it's it's the rent that's really difficult i mean what's it like in in beijing and in china and uh, for that um, in Beijing, it's actually not bad, um, which is kind of surprising for, for a big city. But um, my for me, I have a two-bedroom apartment, and it's 3,600 RMB a month, which I believe is about 560 US dollars. That's what it was the last time I checked. Right. Um, right. And for a two-bedroom apartment, I mean, that is significantly less than I was paying for renting a room um, right. in a house right. when I was living in the States. So, yeah, it's a, it's a two-bedroom apartment, and it's in a great area. Mm. Um, it's in a great area of the city. Like it's really, really close to, um, sort of like the foreigner district. It's close to the business district. It's so, um, yeah. And I think in most places it's even less than that. So a few hundred dollars and you can get, uh, at minimum a room in a really nice apartment. Right. Right. And even if it's a bit more expensive in Beijing, maybe compared to some of the provincial places, you still, if you're there, you've got the opportunity to, to have, uh, all the other, um, work opportunities that you mentioned. I mean, I know I was going to ask, actually, because I know that, you know, some people who are in maybe more provincial towns. Is it is it the case that there are still loads of opportunities um, there as well, work wise? Or, or is this really a Beijing thing that we're talking about? Um, I think there's opportunities as far as teaching English goes, but um... I'm not sure. I don't want to say for certain that there aren't as many opportunities, but my guess is no, because um, a lot of the stuff that's happening in Beijing is just um, like, for, I mean, I can just speak for myself, but as far as writing goes, there's a lot of publications here, a lot of um, expat magazines, that kind of thing. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity. Right. Um, right. And uh, just in other fields, like for web design, that kind of thing, you're going to find more work. Uh, in a city where there are, you know, people from all over the world. It's very international here. Um, people are trying to start their businesses or establish a presence here. Whereas in the smaller towns, it's not like that at all. Um, I haven't seen many, but the ones that I've seen there, it just seems like there's 
not much happening. Uh, I mean, the cost of living is much lower for sure. So if you are just looking to um, like save some money, that kind of thing, um, or just experience China, then then that's a great place to do it. But right. if you're trying to break into something else, um, there's probably less opportunity in the smaller towns, in smaller cities even. Right, right. You mentioned a minute ago about um, things not really being quite as easy in Korea. And I was just going to ask you, you know, for people, let's say somebody is considering maybe going, moving to East Asia, what would be your thoughts on, um, you know, Korea versus China versus maybe other places that you might have also considered, uh, like in terms of the opportunities and, you know, which one, which ones would you suggest would be really more worthwhile looking into? Um, I think it depends on what you want to do and sort of what your priorities are. Um, for example, uh, South Korea is a great place. I mean, I lived uh, right in Seoul. It was <coughs> incredible. The city is awesome. It's quite modern. Uh, there's a lot to do. It's it's great. Um, and South Korea, uh, they pay pretty well. Like I said, most people, I, I met a few people who worked for um, like uh, different kinds of tech companies, um, but that's pretty rare. So if you go over there and you're just looking to make money, you can get a job as an English teacher. Um, I think I think by the time I left, the salary was maybe like two thousand U.S. dollars per month, but that, which probably doesn't sound like that much, but your rent is covered, uh, which is a huge thing. Right. Um, and utility bills are quite low, and um, so if your priority is, you know, to move overseas or to make some money, it's also very easy to send money back to the states or I assume to other countries um, from Korea. So if you have like loans to pay off or anything like that it's also quite good because um, right. it's really easy to save money and to send it wherever you need um but if you're looking to do something else um i it's not a great place to go because like i was saying to get a, a work visa it has to be sponsored by uh, your employer um whereas in china you can get if you can get a business visa which technically you're not supposed to work on but it's what a lot of people do um there are a lot uh there's a lot of different visas um and you can kind of live here and not need to be tied to one company necessarily. Um, so I think that there's a lot more freedom. I know that since moving to China, I have felt um, even freer than I did living in Seoul because I can kind of do whatever I want. I'm not tied to, oh, I'm working for this one employer, which I found, at least where I was working, I was just drained all the time right, by, right. by the demands and the expectations of my bosses. And whereas here, I'm, I am my own boss. So, and... I'm able to do that just because of kind of the way things are set up in China. Yeah, right. Cool. What, what do you think of the main um, sort of practical or even other other kinds of barriers that you need to to address if you want to go and um, live abroad and move abroad? You know, what are the real 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 things that um, that you need to uh, address in in order to make that happen? Hmm. Let's see. In terms of barriers, I think the biggest thing is just getting um, kind of like the paperwork and, and stuff done. Like most places, you're probably going to have to get a visa, right. um, and that can be a little bit of a hassle. Um, like I know that there's other – I mean, there's other places too that actually I don't – know exactly how it is about moving there but like um hong kong is supposed to be amazing more expensive than beijing for sure but it's supposed to be really uh incredible um so if you're into finance or anything like that that's probably where you'd want to go i don't know what the visa situation or like the residency um situation is there and um, there's also places like japan which i think is quite similar to korea in terms of the visas and right. so I, that can be the most frustrating thing if you're thinking okay i want to move overseas some countries are more of a hassle than others, and um, some require certain documentation, and you have to go to the embassy and apply for a visa and that kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. that's um, that's kind of the biggest hassle, I think. But um, it's actually not that difficult. If once you decide where you want to go and figure out what your uh, what your options are there, it's really just a matter of of sorting all of that out. And right. um, in some cases, it's putting up money up front. Um, like if you have, when I moved overseas, my company paid for my flight, which was a huge help because flights from, uh, at least from the U S to Asia are not cheap. Yeah. Um, in some cases there's that, like you need to have money. And if, if you're moving to a place where housing and, uh, your airfare are not provided, you need to have quite a bit saved, 
I think, to come over here. I mean, not quite a bit in, in as in like you need to save for years, but uh, for a few months at least, um, you need a few thousand dollars just to kind of get on your feet. Right, right. Even it's really, it's it's not too difficult. I mean, a, a lot of the issues that come up, you can kind of navigate once you get over here. Um, and I think it's probably a lot easier than than most people think. I know it was way easier than I, I kind of thought this was just an impossible thing. And then once I did it, I was like, there's no reason for anyone who wants to uh, to travel or to move to another country. You yeah, know? I think that's probably true, that it seems like a really big deal and something mm -hmm. that would be a major, you know, a, a major um, sort of hassle to try and make it work. But um, but it's, you know, it's great to hear that actually, I mean, obviously, uh, there were there were. Um, there are probably more complicated things um, for uh, East Asia than, say, moving around within Europe because there's the EU and there's, it's a lot easier and that kind of stuff. But even those, even visa issues, I mean, it, it's all it's all just stuff that you have to get um, bureaucratic stuff that you have to get done. But it's not it's not that difficult to do, I think, if you if you really want to do it. Yeah, I think it's more tedious than it is difficult. I mean, I think that there's a pretty low chance of getting a visa denied. It's just a matter of like, oh, do I have all of this paperwork filled out? Do I have all of this taken care of? Just making sure that everything is is kind of in order, which is a pain. It's time consuming, but um, it it it's not hard to do. Yeah. 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 And do you do you think that um, like I know that a lot of people. They do this for a year or something or two years and then they, you know, then they go back. And sometimes, it, like, it seems like it was more like an extended holiday. It didn't really, uh, they, they sort of fit fit back into the, the same kind of career path that, that other people um, who sort of were, were staying in, the, in their home country um, are, are still on. Other people, you know, have a sort of location independent lifestyle idea that they're going to move around and, and travel into other places or if they do go back to their country of origin you know they end up in doing doing very different things what do you think um sort of the the outlook for you you know do you do you plan to live outside the u.s indefinitely I and mean, what what where do you see yourself going yeah, I definitely, I, I have no plans to go back to the U.S. anytime soon, um, partly just because of the economic situation there. Um, it was pretty grim when I left, and from what I've, from what I've read and uh, sort of observed online, it doesn't sound like it's gotten any better. Um, so there's that. But also, for me, I just, I really enjoy traveling. I really like seeing new places, and um, I had thought, I, I used to read newsletters and stuff um, and different websites about being location independent and thinking, wow, someday I want to do that. Um, so being able to do that right now is is pretty amazing. And I've just gotten to see so much and meet a lot of really interesting people. So for me, my plan is to be, um, you know, in Asia for a while. And if not Asia, then then certainly somewhere else where I can kind of keep doing this. Um, but I, I think you're right. There are people who definitely come over here and it's just like an extended holiday. And I, I, a lot of times I hear people say, oh, you know, I'm doing this thing in China, but uh, I have to go home and grow up. And I'm kind of like, I don't know what that means. Like, and a lot of them were working for good companies um, and doing really interesting things over here. But they had, there's sort of this feeling like, oh, this is just to fun and games right? because I live right. in another country. I have to go back and like kind of plug back in and figure out what my life is. Um, and I think it's just a certain mindset of, you know, oh, it's just going overseas is just for fun. Like you just kind of play around, you get that out of your system. Um, but I think if you come like, I know when I came over, I was like, okay, let me see how this goes. Um, you know, if I, maybe I'll hate it. I kind of didn't think that I would, but let me just give it a shot and see how I feel. Um, but pretty early on, I realized I, I like being over here. And if I can stay, then I would like to have a lifestyle that allows me to kind of move around and travel yeah, for yeah, a while. Yeah. I think it really, it, it, it seems to me that um, the, the mindset that you have about it can have a huge impact on how much you get out of the experience. Because I, when I went to live abroad, I really thought, that's it. I'm, I'm going to go and live in Berlin. That's where I will, I will be indefinitely. I plan to, you know, basically move there for, for good. And in the end, um, that was shortly before the, uh, the, the, the boom in the um, urban development market in Berlin collapsed in the in the mid '90s, and everyone who'd moved there to get jobs, you know, the the opportunities were very different, and things changed for me too. So I actually ended up going back to to the UK, but I think because I had not seen it as like, oh, I'm going to go and have a long holiday and then slip back into my old life, I had seen it as 
I'm I'm changing my life by going there. When I came back, I definitely had different priorities and wanted different things. And I think if that's you know that that in a way it makes it makes the whole experience very different because it means that you can really really get something out of the change changes and in, in perspective and everything that the the experience brings. Whereas, as you say, for people who are going to live abroad but but viewing it as a short break before stepping back into the same career and so forth, I think that does that doesn't really have that much impact on the level of personal freedom that they then experience when they go when they go back because in a sense sort of the the uh it, it is just like a long holiday for them you know what i mean yeah for sure it's uh yeah i think that um there's probably this feeling of you know like obligation or kind of being chained to this lifestyle back wherever they came from mm. um i don't know if people recognize it as being that but that's how i think of it um whereas yeah i think you get a completely different experience when you go over somewhere and you're really open to um sort of when you go over and think okay maybe this is where i'm going to spend a lot of time i know that this is not just vacation i'm going to live in this place for a while mm. it completely mm. changes the experience and i think you invest more um you want to learn more about the about the country that you're living in, about the city, um, kind of getting to know the people, understanding it better. And you're looking at it in different ways because you're thinking, can I make a life here? What am I getting out of this? And even if you know that it's, it's not forever, I think that you go, you come to it with a more open mind and like, what, what is this experience doing for me? How is this changing me? What is it making me think about? Um, and I think it's uh, a far richer experience than just kind of saying, I'm just going to come and party for a while and then I'm going back and I'm going to fall into this like you know nine to five job and role that everyone expects me to play back where I grew up yeah 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 I think it's awesome and I'm, I'm really excited to hear about um, you and and all of the other friends of mine who are um, out in China because that that does seem to be a you know a really interesting place to be right at this moment when I was um, living in Berlin, that was just after reunification. The wall had just fallen, and it was a super wow. interesting time to be there because there was so much changing. And it seems to me like right now, China seems to be one of the places that it just seems like a very special time to be there. That there's so much changing. Is that is that your experience too? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it just especially. Um, I mean, I've only been here eight months, and I have definitely gotten that that feeling you know things are changing things are happening all the time you know i'm always meeting people who are telling me uh, about some industry that they're in that's really growing and there's a lot of opportunity and and it's really awesome i you know there's a, there's definitely a great group of people here in beijing um and i'm really thrilled to be part of uh, sort of like the community of friends that that i'm in and there's this great mentality um among everyone and the sense i get is a lot of like optimism and excitement because there are a lot of opportunities here, even for thinking about starting your own business or, or working for yourself or doing anything like that. Um, and it's, it's really cool. And I think that a lot of that has to do with the fact that Beijing is changing so much so fast. Um, and China in general is too. There's just a lot happening here. Right. Um, and it does kind of, a lot of people I've talked to um, have kind of said the same thing. Like this really feels like the place to be right now. Um, there's a lot happening in China and it's just cool. It's cool to be here. It's cool to witness it and to think like, you know, 10 years from now, wonder what China is going to be like and remember, hey, I was I was kind of there in the middle of, of all of that. Right, right. And actually, that reminds me that I want to make sure that people who who uh, would like to, to read about um, some of your experiences and hear about some of your experiences in China um, can check out um, your blog, which is Chinarchy. Is it Chinarchy.com? Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, Chinese.com. And um, it started out as uh, the so, sort of like travel teaching blog um, by Anderson. And then a few more people moved over here. And now it's a little bit more of a group effort. There's different podcasts and YouTube series that are on there. Um, and there's uh, posts and podcasts and stuff. So, yeah, a lot of stuff about living in China. From a, also from a voluntarist perspective, looking at you know looking at the culture and uh, and the changes that are taking there from from that outlook as well. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. And what about your personal blog? Because I know the name has changed, but I think the URL is still the same. So can you say in terms of your blog, what's the URL for that? Sure. It's uh, it's still it's always sunny in South Korea dot com. Um, I didn't, I was going to change it when I moved to China. <laughs> if you go to the page, South Korea is crossed out and it says China, but yes. <laughs> I have 
what's the name of it yet. Um, yeah, it hasn't actually been updated in a while, but there's a lot um, on there about about Korea, and I'm actually hoping to start doing some more writing about like about travel and different experiences that I've had in China. So, um, th yeah, there's definitely some stuff on there as well. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Jamie. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Thanks. Great. I've enjoyed our enjoyed our conversation. Excellent. Okay. Thanks very much. Bye. Okay. Thanks. Bye bye.